Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. The thought of a burst pipe fills many with dread and lots of drawing to do afterwards. But in one specific case, it saved an incredible cache of North American aviation documentation. Out in Minnesota, the Air Corps Library is in the process of digitizing this incredible collection of original drawings for legendary aircraft such as the P-51 Mustang. And the manager of the library is Esther Obe, who joins us today. Esther is working her way through this incredible treasure trove of documentation. But before we get into that, I have to ask a very important question. It has been on my bucket list for years to get to Oshkosh. So as Esther's just returned from this year's event, I have to ask, how was it? Oshkosh was great. It's always great. It's exhausting and it's amazing. It's work from 6.30 in the morning until 11.30 at night, um, but it's great. I call it my reset for the year because it brings me back. I get to see people in person and reminds me why we do what we do at Air Corps. That's, that's why I love it so much. Do you get to walk around the flight line and go, that's one of ours, that's one of ours, that's one of ours? Um, sometimes, yeah. And for me, it's very cool because a lot of times I hear this airplane is only here because of what you're doing on the website. And it's a very fun, like behind the scenes look. So even if Air Corps as a company didn't assist on a restoration, a lot of times they use the Air Corps library website on the restoration in some way. So I feel like I have a little bit into some of those airplanes um, in a very, very behind the scenes way. <laughs> That's fantastic. So let's, let's start with you. So how did you get into this gig? Have you always been an aviation nut or was this sort of slipping and falling and waking up with the North American Aviation Library? <laughs> right. I would say I got very lucky. Um, I did not necessarily, I mean, I was not that weird little girl who was obsessed with airplanes by any means. Uh, my brother and I do laugh about it, though, because he had a very long period of his childhood where he was obsessed with airplanes. And so by default, I got into them a little bit and would do things like build these miniature paper airplane replicas for him of the airplanes that he liked and things of that nature. So, yeah, and then he sort of got out of it. He got into cars and then I got into cars and and then later in life, here I am back to aviation, which is honestly been really really amazing i i do very much appreciate all of the technical side of things um but it was really just me getting lucky and finding this position in a very rural area of the country where i did not think that i was going to be able to use my degree in any way and then just sort of fell into this situation and got to create my own job in essence and it's been it's been amazing <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about Air Corps as a company. What do you do? What is the day job of well, the company, I, guess, I suppose? We, we're going sure. to talk about your day job in a lot more detail. <laughs> right, right. Air Corps as a company, our main business is, I tell people, World War II restoration. The bulk of our employees work in that realm. Um, so we have a quite large fabrication shop that feeds parts into our aircraft restoration and then we have all the guys that work in restoration doing the actual wrenching, as we call it. Um, <laughs> and then we have our couple of little offshoot uh, businesses, not businesses, but arms, I guess. So we have me with the library and we have an art department and we have a reverse engineering, a 3D scanning arm. We have a maintenance arm. Um, so I we are a little bit different than most restoration shops in that we are sort of a one stop shop we can do pretty much anything in-house things that other people might farm out um, to outside contractors so that's pretty neat I, people are always a little bit I, I feel like we get misunderstood people know us for one thing and we're always struggling to tie everything together that we do and make it clear that we have more capabilities I guess so it's not just assembly, it's, it's everything right down to the, the the smallest element of a rebuild or a restoration is you're, you're getting to that level of detail. Yeah, yeah. Every little placard and marking, water slide, decal, up to, 
yeah, machining parts and milling and CNC, all of that. Yeah, up until final assembly. I mean, we do farm out a few things here and there, but our shop has grown so much in the past even five years since or six years since I started that our capabilities are pretty impressive at this point. I was listening to when you you and Ken were on the Green Dot podcast and you had a fascinating phrase on that. You said our aircraft are factory fresh. When we talk about the level of detail you're going to to that, how much detail would you go to? Because I remember you were talking about even what you put on the sheet metal, which just blew my mind. Right. I mean, that's one of my favorite stories, the sheet metal story. Um, I feel like some people might say that the level of detail that we go to is too much. (laughs) But honestly, like that's one of the things that I got really excited about when I first got involved at Air Corps was that level of detail. So another one of my favorite stories, so not to retell things, I have a a different one. So it has to do with rivets. So literally this tiniest detail that you could have in an airplane, right? So back during the war, not all the rivets that they were using were the same color. Um, There was green and blue and yeah, just different colors of rivets. And so In order to recreate that, we purchase our rivets from different suppliers that are also different colors and then mix them up so that we have this also array of different colored rivets, which again, similar to the sheet metal that we stamp in its original um, Reynolds uh, markings, no one was really ever gonna see all those different colored rivets necessarily once once it's done, but we just, yeah. I feel like that's what we really love to get into, which I do think is a direct correlation with the amount of data that we have with the library and being able to find out those small details. Yeah, Um, it's knowing that those small details are there. You don't necessarily need to see them, but when you look at it as a whole, you know it's gone down to that finer detail. Right. And I really think that that's what our customers come to us for i mean i feel like we're sort of known for getting that deep into it and that's really what they appreciate it and yeah that kind of keeps us going yeah so what's in the shop at the moment (laughs) um so our project that's the closest to being finished is our p47 which is a d-23 model very specific so it's a razorback p47 And we're very excited because it will be a unique P-47. There's only, I believe, seven, maybe nine P-47s flying in the United States currently and only a handful overseas. And ours will be unique among those because, well, it is a D model, so it's a Razorback, which is unique. And of the flying Razorbacks, ours will be the only example of a Republic-built Razorback P-47. All of the other ones that are flying, I believe, are Curtis built. So that's kind of our neat little thing. And we're hoping that that's going to be flying in the next couple of months. Um, That's the goal. So very soon. And then we have, yeah, we've got three, I should say three and a half Mustangs um, in the shop right now. (laughs) (laughs) And I probably shouldn't get into that. I could talk about each one of them for the whole podcast. I'm sure there's going to be people listening going, yeah, forget the other stuff. Just talk about those. For the next <laughs> right. I mean, I can those. tell you that, well, I'll, I'll go into it super briefly, as briefly as I possibly can. So we've got, we've got Thunderbird, which is actually will be a C model fuselage with a D model wing, which is what our customer wants uh, performance wise. And Thunderbird is a very cool airplane flown by Jimmy Stewart, Jackie Cochran, that's all I'll say about that. Um, <laughs> and go, then we go got... look it up, people. It's an incredible story. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hopefully that one is maybe, I don't know, next spring, next summer, next fall. Oh, I, wow. I mean, yeah, the fuselage is together and that one's a little bit further along. And then we have um, Shillelagh, which is an early, I believe Shillelagh is a B model mustang and that has a really incredible story behind it also uh uh, several of our owners went to france and did an excavation on the original shillelagh uh, that was buried on a french estate there and that that takes way too long i can't get into that story it's very cool (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, that's on our website. There is a, yeah, a description of the story behind that. And then we have what we're just kind of calling the B model right now, which is another incredibly cool story. So it's the airframe that was modified with the additional fuel tank to make the mission to Berlin possible. Um, so it is not an airframe that saw combat, but it has a very unique and specific historical significance with that modification. Um, wow. Yeah, so that that's a very neat project to be involved in. And then we're doing some maintenance on our the, the half a Mustang, which is the Tuskegee Airmen Red Tail uh, by request, which is back in the shop right now. And then our sort of... I guess the last one would be our AT-10, our Beechcraft AT-10, not to be confused with the AT-11. It's a very odd, rare airplane, none of which are flying currently, and I believe there's only one, maybe two, that are actually fully put together that are not airworthy. Uh, one of them is at the Air Force Museum in Dayton. And then we're trying to make one airworthy, which is resource-wise been an interesting journey. Um, and it's also wood, which is not exactly our normal wheelhouse. <laughs> so that has been interesting too, but that's been a really fun one to see it come together and the skins are on the fuselage and it is, it is coming together, but definitely a departure for us as far as materials. Yeah. Oh, that all sounds so exciting. What a, yeah. what a, what a terrible place cool. you have to go to work in. It's the worst. <laughs> Okay, let's let's get on to the worst, the day job. Okay. What is the Air Corps Library and how did it become your day job? There's there's a story and a half. Sure, yeah. So Air Corps Library started, well, I, we've always had a little bit of a, it's hard to come up with an elevator speech for what library is because it's so specific. And the best that I've ever come up with is technical resources for warbird owner operators mechanics and enthusiasts um, which is very broad and unless you're in one of those categories you don't know what that means <laughs> and sometimes even if you are in that those categories you don't know what it means so essentially what I do is I source out and collect and digitize any engineering drawings technical manuals Anything that helped a World War II airplane fly or was directly related to the operation, maintenance, and fabrication of those airplanes. And so I digitize and I add them to the website so that we can use them for our projects and other people can use them for their restorations, model builders, anybody who has an interest in the technical side of these airplanes. And so... Originally, the site was supposed to be a way for us to internally organize our information, and then it just kept growing, and the idea for it grew, and then the owners decided to make it live to the general warbird public as a sort of, I consider library to be a goodwill gesture to the entire industry. Um, and so in December of 2015, the site launched. And originally we were a little concerned, like how do we get enough information to make this a viable resource for people? And it was thankfully for me, the opposite of that. Like there was a literal outpouring of people like dying to give us their information to be digitized. And normally I don't keep things. People just send me stuff, I digitize, I send it back and they can keep their original, do what they please with it. And we just keep the digital file and um, it just exploded. Um, and the people that I talk to daily, weekly, what have you, are at a basic level, they're just really excited that their information is gonna go somewhere where it's gonna get used for its intended purpose, um, which is a really fascinating and cool thing for me. I came from a museum type background and so I love museums and I love the idea of cataloging and preserving information, but I also know the downside of that being that it's once something goes into a museum archive, it's very difficult to access it again. So 
it's very neat for me to be in a position where I get to catalog and preserve, but also help people really easily get access to the information that we're preserving. So. Technical question. When you say digitize something, what mm -hmm. does that mean? So with my day job, lots of data, lots, lots of metadata, things like that. Are you literally just scanning a, a picture, a drawing and uploading it and saying, um, here, here, here it is, folks, or what goes into it? How, how do you build it up so that your archive is as usable as it can be? Because we've all tried to find stuff in museum archives and just bang our heads against a wall. Sure. Well, I guess I'll take your technical question and split it into even more technical. <laughs> I feel like you have to branch. <laughs> so when you talk about when you talk about manuals, it's one process. And when you talk about drawings, it's another process. And then Ken's drawings are like a totally, that's like a third option, I guess. So the bulk of what we have for engineering drawings on the site comes from microfilm. So during World War II, all those original drawings were photographed and put on microfilm and then distributed as sets of microfilm for an individual aircraft. And so there's lots of those sets floating around. In the U.S., we're very lucky to have a lot more access to that kind of stuff. I know that people overseas getting that type of information is a lot more difficult. But so somebody finds their grandpa's or their dad's trunk up in the attic and there's a set of microfilm on it and they Google around and they find us. And then that's, that's usually kind of how that, how that happens. There are people out there who have large collections of microfilm that are kind enough to let us digitize um, some of what they have too. But yeah, so as you can imagine, digitizing microfilm is its own specific process. And so once that's done, what we have is a digital image of each slide that's on the microfilm. And then we developed a program called Drawing Renamer. It's very exciting. Um, and it just allows me to go through and type in the part number that's listed on each drawing so that now that drawing can be found incredibly quickly if you're looking at a parts catalog um, or, yeah, doing any kind of maintenance or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's the microfilm side. And the, the manual side really is just, I have three, four different types of scanners that I use depending on what type, how the manual is bound um, and what size the pages are, things like that. And so I'm just essentially scanning each document as a PDF. And then, yeah, then the, the uploading process begins, which is a whole, I will not get in. I mean, it's a crazy like 20 step process where we have to run it through a cloud-based server to take apart each page and slice up each page. And it gets, <laughs> it gets very technical, but the end result is getting it into the admin side of the library site where I enter like, um, or we enter metadata. So keywords, title, document number, revision date, the donor of the manual, and then how they would like to be identified on the live side of the site if they'd like to be identified, um, all kinds of keywords and essentially anything that we think is a pertinent bit of information that people would try to find that manual using. And obviously, like for me, getting so detailed into it, like I prefer to find things by their document number. Um, which is a little bit more of a, a detailed level of things. A lot of the users are just kind of searching for like, I want to find a parts catalog for this aircraft or an overhaul manual for this component. And they're kind of just searching, looking for their specific model, which is all information that we also add. But um, a lot of times if you're looking in a manual, say a maintenance manual, it'll say for more information, see tech order, 01-60JE-45 and so without any other information than that having the document number is very crucial in a lot of situations so yeah. and in my experience that reference is usually the one that's not digitized and you have to go rummaging for it see this right. one and then you're off. but that's that's hawker that's a whole a whole different kettle of fish so sure mm. We, we won't we won't go there they 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 were a bit i mean i get to deal tasty. with that too <laughs> those are the questions that i get people are like 
hey, why don't you have this on the site? And I'm like, all right. And so then I get to go down that, that rabbit hole. I mean, I, the estimate that I've read is that in 1953, the Air Force estimated that there had been 25,000 documents published during the war. So it's not like we have everything <laughs> that everybody needs. And that's only military published documents. That doesn't count all the individual manufacturer publications that were coming out. And it's just, I mean, it's insanity. It's job security in a very good way. <laughs> but <laughs> so, so that's really great. So you, someone coming to this site, they could put in quite a fuzzy term and probably hit what they, they need to need to find if they're looking for something specific or if they've got that actual reference it all goes in that's fab yeah that's that's kind of the goal sometimes people get too broad like if you type in p51 mustang into the website (laughs) you're not really gonna you you probably will get zero results actually because that's it's way too broad like i i do run into that and i ask people okay so Instead of doing that, you need to go into the P-51 area and look at the, you know, 60,000 drawings that we have that aren't identified as P-51 Mustang because, like, that's just too much. Like, you wouldn't want 60,000 search results. Like, yeah, so. <laughs> just need a response saying, you're in the right place, but now think of right. a little bit more detail. Yeah. Yes, get a little bit more into it. Because the site is really, it was designed for mechanics. Mm-hmm. So, people, you already know you're working on a Mustang, so... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've I've very very nearly made a joke there, but I won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you were you mentioned it a second ago. You said that that Ken's drawings were a little bit special. So let's start talking about Ken Gingerberg. What did he have, or more to, more to the point, what did he save and how? Sure. Yeah. So we'll start at the beginning with that because I feel like that's the key. So. Um, Ken worked for North American Rockwell, uh, the Columbus, Ohio division from 1969 to 1988. Um, he had been sort of a lifelong aviation enthusiast, um, and started there at Rockwell or North American Rockwell when he was fairly young. He would say that he was the youngest person who was working in the drafting room when he came on and it was right after the merger with North American and Rockwell and there was a lot of bad blood there had been a lot of people let go at that point and he definitely got some mean comments from people (laughs) his first several weeks on the job being a young person but uh, yeah he started out as a draftsman um, and he would say that back then you were a draftsman and an engineer there was not a differentiation between those two jobs um and then he i feel like most people who are involved in a north american affiliated company he pretty much i mean he stayed with them for a very long time and so in 1988 when the columbus ohio factory was closing because the b1 uh, project that they were assisting with was wrapping up in that area and so the factory was shutting down somebody else was buying it i forget who um and at that point he was the head of the master dimensions department um so he kind of stayed in that very specific engineering role and got even more technical um so from the beginning of his career obviously had an appreciation for engineering data and things like that and so as the factory work was sort of wrapping up he had heard these rumblings that all of the non-current drawings in the archive were going to be incinerated and columbus had become this sort of repository for north american archives and ken and i've talked about it quite a bit and we're not exactly 100 percent sure why that was but they did hold at that point a lot of data that had come out of the inglewood plant and the Dallas plant and Kansas City and yeah just an interesting turn of events and so as somebody who at one point or probably throughout his entire career there had access to the archives as they called it the vault that was their their term for it in the factory he was horrified that this information was going to be burned and so he started making phone calls and writing letters and doing 
anything that he could and he kind of got the door slammed in his face essentially they were like nope decision's been made and he was offering you know no at no cost to the company i would like to become the caretaker of this information and you know preserve it for future generations and they yeah just said no which is amazing considering the history of the company i wonder maybe if the merger had skewed that legacy a bit sure well and i think that that i mean it's a common thing for you know you acquire another company and you're still you right and so you you care about you first and then this other acquisition a little bit less and i mean in any any industry anywhere um i mean people purge their archives at some point right it's and at this point it was it's all on microfilm. Why do we need the originals? That was really like, I mean, in the 80s, microfilm was like the holy grail. Like, oh my God, we found this amazing new technology that <laughs> everything's just going on microfilm and it's going to be amazing. And now we know that microfilm is one of the least stable medias that, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Anyway. I'm going to ask you about that in but a minute. That's Right, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're deviating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyway, Ken heard these rumblings and he did what he could and the door got slammed in his face. And then what would generally be perceived as a d total disaster was actually what ended up saving these drawings. So a pipe burst in the room where they were putting these drawings in preparation for them to go in the incinerator. And the room sort of filled up with water. Um, I have some pictures of it, um, and the essentially the block foundation, you can see it has this huge crack in it, and everything got completely drenched that was in there, and so they pulled everything out and just heaped it into this huge pile on the factory floor, and there actually is a photo of that as well, um, and then it just sat there for two weeks, and then finally someone called Ken, and they said, you know, you expressed interest in this? <laughs> And now that we can't do what we wanted with it, I guess you can come and take it. Um, yeah. wet, but you have wet, to take stuff it. Stuff doesn't burn as well. This is true. Yeah, mm. made made burning it a little <laughs> bit more difficult. <laughs> um, so they said you need to come and get it today, essentially, um, if you want it. And so he rented a truck and grounded up a couple friends, and they threw it and everything in the truck. And when he got there with the truck. There was more stuff. So there was all the wet stuff. And then there was some wooden crates of drawings that had not gotten wet. They were also grouped in with that. And they were like, you can take these also. Um, and their only caveat for him was that they didn't want the drawings to be blowing around in a landfill at any point. And they said, if you ever need to dispose of them, you should also burn them. Because we don't want like the company name to be portrayed in a negative way um in any sense so i mean they were still thinking about that so i think that definitely shows that they did care about it you know in some regard for sure but anyway so he took those drawings to a barn um and laid out the wet ones to dry them and then packed everything back up into boxes and into those crates and then stored it I believe at that point they weren't living in Cincinnati where they are now, um, but he stored them temporarily, I believe in a storage unit. And then when they moved into the place where they are currently, he stored half of them in, or I shouldn't say half, he stored most of them in his hangar um, at their little airport nearby. And then the ones that he thought were really great, he kept them at home. Um, he's a big B-25 guy. That's his favorite airplane. And so most of the drawings that were at his house were B-25 I, I, knew, I knew I liked oh. Ken. I do right. love the B-25. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So that was like, and then 31 years passed. Um, and he just, his original idea was that he was going to sell the collection like piece by piece, drawing by drawing. Um, but that never actually ended up happening, fortunately for us. Um, and he, his, what Ken really wanted and wants for the collection is for people, as many people as possible, to enjoy the collection as much 
as he has um, over the time that he's been able to putter around with it and, yeah, organize things and look through things. And so that was when I first talked with Ken or in our initial conversations over that first year. That was sort of what I had wanted to to convey, that we have um, a little bit easier means to do that, to help get the collection out there into the eyes of the public and show it to people um, in a way that they'll hopefully really appreciate and will resonate with them. Um, what, what were they printed on? Because I know that sort of British blueprints tend to be sort of that waxed linen um stuff which is which are beautiful to hold what 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 were these mm-hmm. ones were they the same sort of thing or or were they miraculously paper that didn't just completely disappear sure so some of them are that waxed linen um which is a great media not though if it's going to get wet <laughs> um <laughs> so the starch or the wax on the back uh tends to d- deteriorate pretty easily when it gets soaking wet so the linen drying is the did get wet did not fare very well but that was a very very small percentage of that stuff and obviously the linen drawings that were in the crates the things that didn't get wet are still in amazing condition um, but the bulk the the vast majority of the drawings are on what i would call well ken would call it a tracing vellum so that's what i call it um and it is a very resilient paper, a much better quality than any of the paper that you're going to find on your desk today <laughs> that would just have completely deteriorated if it had gotten wet. Um, and they're pencil. So pencil on this tracing vellum. And I mean, pencil fares very well when it gets wet. It doesn't, um, it's not like ink. Uh, so really it was kind of a best case scenario Like I say, I don't even like to call that flood a disaster because it was sort of like the saving grace of the entire collection. (laughs) Yeah, and really a very tiny percentage of the drawings actually were damaged beyond repair. So That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you know, you don't think of pencil on paper being the resilient one, would you? You'd think it would be good old fashioned ink. But that's... That's me taking a flight of fantasy. Let's get to the important sure. stuff. What types of aircraft were on the drawings? Right. So I feel like in the, our conversations about this that I've had in like the blog articles that I've written and things like that, um, people think it's just Mustang stuff, which is totally not the case. So it, if, to be fair, if it was, we probably would be talking because we're going to come back to the big B-25 picture in a minute. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I so when I first initially started cataloging, I put things in um in piles by their part number prefix, which for people who aren't as nerdy as me and don't love part numbering systems, um North American their prefix system tells you what specific model of aircraft that drawing was originally designed for, whether or not it was used interchangeably later on other aircraft. So the earliest prefix that I have, I think, is maybe like an 11, which is like mid-30s, vintage, very, very early T6 predecessor trainer aircraft. Um, Like, what is it, like the BC-9 or something like that? Yeah. So anyway, so it ranges from there. So like all of these T6 variants um, up until what we know is the T6 or the SNJ today. And then there's B-25, obviously, there's T-28, um, a surprising amount of twin Mustang P-82 drawings. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there is a smattering of newer stuff, kind of post T-28 time frame, but not really a lot. In my mind, the information that was kept on by Rockwell uh, because there was that. They didn't just get rid of everything. Um, They were logically more probably concerned with the newer stuff, the jet things of that ilk. So, but there is, I mean, I guess all of the aircraft that you know North American for during World War II are represented in Ken's collection. We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. 
Hello, folks. I'm Zach White, chair of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves Charity. We're a new organization that honors the veterans of the period 1775 to 1815. What many don't realize is that those who died in conflicts before 1900 are not covered by war graves commissions, meaning that many veterans' graves are lying in disrepair. But the problem is more serious than that, because plenty of veterans' bodies are being excavated, but nobody is burying them. Instead, these war heroes' bodies are lying in cardboard boxes, their sacrifice forgotten. At the NRWGC, we're changing that, restoring graves and giving these veterans the dignity of a proper burial. So if you feel that the war dead deserve this basic respect, take a look at our website, www.nrwgc.com, to find out more about our aims, how you can donate, and the perks of being a member. Thank you. And we're back with Esther Obby discussing the Air Corps Library and the incredible Ken Gingerberg collection. I'm going to get very geeky here because I'm a big fan of the A36 as well. And I think on your blog, you mentioned oh, there's some yes. A36 drawings as well. So, Yes. So even more than that, I mean, we can go back a step further. So the prototype Mustang, the NA73X. So the very, very first prototype of the Mustang. We have drawings for that also. Um, not uh, by no means a full set, but... That is one of my favorite aspects. I feel like it really gives you like a great idea about what the collection means because you look at those early drawings that are dated pre-October 1940, so pre-first flight of that prototype, and it may, it helps you understand that. I mean, most people who know the Mustang know the the famed story, like 120 days, right? They were building this this airplane. Um, and they did it in 117 days, but they were also, it wasn't like the design was complete and they just fabricated the parts and built the airplane in 117 days. They were also designing it at the same time concurrently. And those drawings show that. And my favorite example is the pilot's checklist for the NA-73X is dated 11 days before the first flight of the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> So I feel like that one thing in a nutshell really sums up like the magnitude and just in my opinion, the absolute insanity of what they were doing during that period. I mean, I don't think we could ever do what they did then. I don't, we couldn't do something like that now. I mean, I, it was an incredible feat and yeah. I, I always think Schmuid must have the patience of a saint when the salesman, the big boss, walks in and goes, right, we've signed a new deal for that fighter you've been wanting to do for ages. Right. <laughs> you've got 150 days. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. And hearing, I've, I found a gentleman uh, whose father worked on that initial design team for the Mustang and oh. yeah, I, I have a bunch of his dad's drawings. And so he got, he told me some pretty cool stories, but I mean, the things you hear are true. Like those guys, it was a very small team, but they ate and they slept and they worked at the factory. They didn't go home. They worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week during that period to get that done, which obviously labor laws now would probably... <laughs> make that impossible there'd be a, there'd be a few yeah, raised exactly. eyebrows yeah but the, 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 the overtime must have been fantastic right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah but just a an incredible period like oh obviously in uh, american history for sure but it is very impressive to think that yeah human ingenuity we were able to do something like that British money there. There you go. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, says, says, says the Canadian in the sure. room. Right. We've got to talk about this. So on your blog, ladies and gentlemen, go to the Air Corps Library blog because the pictures are incredible. Is Ken's favorite picture that when I saw it, I think my eyes popped out on Stokes. It is a three-quarter detail of the B-25 tail. And it, it it's just mind blowing. And then on the other podcast, we which 
we won't mention because yeah i don't want to lose listeners ken also says the one for the the machine gun pack in the nose as well which isn't on the blog right so I, I know i'm so you can, you can put <laughs> right. as well. but the, but they're, they're huge I'm, I'm geeking out and i'm not explaining it well it's very very big mm-hmm. are they all really really big or are they you know sort of sizes and details and what are we talking just sort of schematics or are we talking this sort of really lovely three-quarter designs as well so it definitely runs the gamut so i mean the bulk of the drawings are definitely what ken would they called it in the factory cut size so the standard size drawings that range from a which is like our current eight and a half by eleven to so there's north american did a b c d g and then the roll size so anything larger than that so b size is like 11 by 17 g size is more of that like uh, i don't know it's like 42 by 36 and then you bump into the roll size um and obviously the size of the drawing usually directly i I like right right (laughs) (laughs) and the size of the drawing directly correlates to the complexity of the drawing right standard like what you would imagine. The A-size drawings yeah. are single individual parts and springs. And then the cool stuff <laughs> is the roll size. And among the cool roll size drawings are those sort of three-quarter perspective views um, that are more rare. But for the general population and even people who don't know anything about aircraft, those are always the coolest drawings. And yeah, the nose one, the nose gun installation, which is actually the eight gun nose installation for the B-25, is the one that Ken had, he had it framed hanging up in his office at home. Um, and it's Good man. very large, Good man. right? Yeah. <laughs> when we when we got the drawings from him, we were like, Ken, you should keep that like hung up on your wall. Like if that's your favorite drawing, we know that it's here if we need it. Like just take it. And he was like, nope. <laughs> You guys are taking it, There's, and he wouldn't. He would not let us leave it there, um, and so now that's hanging up out at our archive. But if he kept one, he'd probably start rummaging and. No, I, I feel like it's just. I mean, Ken is like the the picture perfect engineer. He's a very analytical thinker, and it was everything or like that was just it. There wasn't any like halfway point. He was like, "This is your stuff now, and you're gonna have all of it." <laughs> <laughs> So one of the term that I use to describe those larger drawings, like the ones that are in the blog, is technical artistry. Um, that's kind of the term that I use mm-hmm. just because, I mean, it's such a technical topic. I mean, you're talking about building an airplane, right? And all of the dimensions and the details that go into that. But those drawings are done in a way that I don't think anyone would argue if you said it was artistic. They're just on their own they can be considered art. Um, And that's one of the things that really amazes me about looking at them and thinking about those draftsmen was that they were engineers, they were right brain people, but they were also left brain people. Like to be able to imagine that technical side of things and then have the artistic talent to effectively convey it is pretty incredible. And not something that we think about today because we have CAD to do the art for us and it takes out that art element um Cadma. yeah <laughs> so we mentioned it a little while ago the the sort of the joys of microfilm in the 80s i suppose the question is if you've got the microfilm why is the drawing still important sure well maybe you can like can i just say like insert images here i'll send you a couple images and you can overlay them <laughs> over the video of us <laughs> um i mean so microfilm One, the more you use it, the more it gets damaged. And once microfilm is damaged, there's no going back, Um, even when you digitize it. I mean, it's not a born digital image. So there's, you only can adjust with the, the original image that you have. So if it's stored in incorrect conditions, it can darken, it can lighten. There's a lot of human aspect things that gets into it, human error. So if like the person photographing it bumped the camera a little bit and the image is blurry, there's just nothing we can do about that now. That image is just blurry and you can't read things. So anything that you do with microfilm is essentially damaging it more and more. And so the amazing thing about these originals is that everything is legible 
anything that you couldn't read on the microfilm because it was dark or light or scratched or there was a piece of dirt on top of it is all just right there to see. And for us, people who are actually building airplanes using this data, that is a huge bonus for us. We can answer these questions that prior we just had to guess or yeah figure out doing some reverse engineering type processes and so there's there's that aspect but the additional aspect is that there's so many drawings in this collection that never got put on microfilm um so the microfilm stuff is by definition just the production drawings and even that there's a little wiggle room in that definition as well there's always drawings that you find listed somewhere and the drawings not on the microfilm and you're like what how is this <laughs> how how did this happen but it did and so i mean just a couple of weeks ago there was one of the guys in the shop was looking at a drawing and there was another part number listed on that drawing that wasn't on the microfilm and i was able to find that in ken's collection um so it's definitely giving us the opportunity to learn more about North American than we were previously able to, which is pretty amazing in itself. And then, of course, there's all of the like experimental drawings, just things that they were toying with, ideas that never made it to production. So obviously, by default, never made it onto the microfilm. And I mean, that was true with any company. I mean, obviously you don't just draw part once and that's the one you go with and you never have any other iterations of that. There are, you know, tens, hundreds maybe iterations of a single part or assembly that people are toying with. And seeing that stuff is very cool um, and really gives you like a very unique peek into the factory and what they were trying and what failed or just they went another route any number of scenarios. So I guess you're able to see that entire evolution of the type, especially with the multitude of different marks of Mustang that you, we would call them marks, different series of Mustangs that you guys have. You're able to see what that journey was from an A to a B all the way through to an F80, whatever the twin twin one was, which is really cool. And I can never remember the designation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> F82. That's the yeah. one. 86 was all North American, but really different to a Mustang. Very different, yes. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of my cataloging process, actually, is the date is a huge factor for me on the drawing, the date that it was, the draftsman signed it, essentially, because it does give you that linear look at how things were getting developed. And as I catalog more and more of those, and as we move towards finishing at some point, cataloging the drawings, like being able to look at it in that sort of calendar view timeline wise, and not just for one specific airplane, but you can see, mm. you know, what systems were going on with the Mustang at the same time they were working on this with the B-25. And so that will be a really neat thing once everything is fully cataloged. So that's the last questions I've got is, are you done yet? So the answer to that is no. no. But what we haven't said is how many of these things are there? Because right. you've been on this for a while now. So there's a lot. Right. I mean, so when we got the collection in 2019, it was the end of 2019, December, Ken had estimated that there was approximately 8,000 non-current or maybe current drawings. I forget which one he said. Um, and I was kind of, I, you know, I looked at the bulk and I was like, eh, I feel like there's quite a few more than that here in total. And so, but you really have no idea, right? Until you start actually cataloging them. And so after I had kind of unpacked things and started putting them in piles, I was like, well, there may be 15,000. Like that seems like a fairly decent number. And then I started cataloging them, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and so when I finished cataloging the cut size Mustang drawings, so the small stuff, there was already over 15,000 just of that. And so my new number is 50,000. That's kind of like where I think we might end up closer to. So... Not just, yeah, a couple boxes here and there for sure. And it, it, I mean, it's very deceiving 
when I was initially going through, I'd pull out a rolled, you know, bunch of drawings and you think, oh, there's like 25 drawings in here. And then there's like a hundred. Goodness. And you're so... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah, a, mind boggling for sure. Yeah. But that's, <laughs> I suppose that's exciting. And also a little bit ugh, when you think you're getting to that last roll must have had like the most ever in any of the roles you unrolled you thought i'm finally here and then bosh there's like you know 200 little bits of paper for nuts and bolts no i guess i feel like the interesting thing about maybe it's me coming from a museum background and really being someone who loves like the most tedious tasks that other people would just roll their eyes and they're like oh i could never do this like where would you even start and you're just like you just start with number one and you just keep going like there's i just for me, that's like a really gratifying thing to just like take it one at a time and know that there's thousands more to come. Um, and I don't know, it's it's that's where I get really nerdy. And I just yeah, like you see, I'm I'm I, I'm more chaos. I just go. I'm going into the middle and just you know like Scrooge McDuck dive straight in, <laughs> sure. like, which is which is why I don't work in an archive. And why, when I do go to an archive, the archivists sure. probably hate me when I hand this stuff out. That's that's a whole other story. If there's anyone listening from Q, I'm really sorry, but yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll be back in a couple of weeks. <laughs> no, no, it's yeah. You just start at the beginning and work your way through. That's yeah. But I mean, we'll we'll see. We're in the process of. We bought a new building last year. Uh, at Air Corps, and we're building an archive space into this new building to store the drawings. And the hope is that we'll, when that is finished and we're ready to move the drawings in, we can expedite the cataloging process at that point so that things are cataloged as they move into that and we're not retroactively trying to go back and pull things out and catalog them so that we can find everything. Because right now, I mean, the bulk of the collection, we don't even really know what's there because it hasn't been cataloged yet. Um, so it's not searchable and it's it's difficult to find. But when that time does come, I'll probably hire some very non-aviation people to help me catalog. All I care about is that they're a fast and accurate typer. Because if, like, if you came to help me, for example, someone who's into aviation... I'm, 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 I'm on a plane. <laughs> But nothing would ever get done, yeah, right? I mean, that, yes. you just, like, you'd find a drawing and 20 minutes later, you're still looking at the same drawing and, you know, somebody else, some random, you know, college business student could have gotten, you know, 150 drawings cataloged in that same amount of time, so. <laughs> we've, we've only known each other an hour and you already know me so well. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It became clear, you know, people so, come out and they look and they're just like, you can't help because people do offer to help. And I'm like, you can come and research. That's fine. But like, we need people that like, don't care about the subject matter to catalog. Like, that's what we need. Just want people to look at the numbers, right, figure yes. out what it is and move on. Not go. Ooh. Yes. So this, this has been so much fun. And so that my last question is kind of redundant, but what, what does it mean to you to be able to be working your way through this archive? Wow. Um, it's, I guess it's a very humbling experience, to be honest. And there's something about paper as an artifact that is very personal, um, much more so than, I don't know, like you think about a book and a book was printed and there was lots of other people that handled it kind of in between now and then. And, but these pieces of paper that, were like touched by the draftsman. They had it on their desk and they signed their name on it and it's there in pencil, it's not a copy, is a very like, you feel very connected to them. And for me being the person that gets to go through them and in reality being the first person outside of a North American employee to ever touch these drawings is I, it's very humbling, I guess. That's really the only word that I can think of to describe it. It's a very amazing experience. Um, and I feel very, very lucky to have been the person to find or work with Ken and be able to, um, yeah, continue his legacy in essence to 
continue preserving them in the way that he did. Um, and it also really makes me want to write a book about the draftsman. That's like my passion. My personal passion project is telling these people's story who in essence are like a forgotten group in the war effort. I mean, we talk about, you know, Lee Atwood, Dutch Kindleberger. We talk about these people really high level. We talk about test pilots and we talk about military pilots and all of these people who contributed to the war effort and these thousands and thousands of people who were working like I do behind the scenes, um, putting out the information that made, made building these airplanes possible is I think a really important story to tell. And that's really what I think about, like as I'm going through these drawings is those guys and wanting to know more about them and just who they were as people how they came into that profession, what they did after, if they enlisted or not, you know, all these, all these questions come to mind. And I think it's just a really neat aspect of the war effort that deserves more attention. For sure. And yeah, like you were saying, the, the, the Moultons, they would work out 117 to come up with something like came the must is, is remarkable. And what each of those people brought, those different viewpoints that all sort of fed through into these things that were as evolutionary as they became. So yeah, I'm, yeah, okay, I'm going to start nagging you for the book now. When do you start? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I need, if any of, any of the listeners out there have ever seen a early 1940s vintage North American company directory, they need to get in contact with me because that's really what I need. I've got all the last names on the drawings, but I need first names in order to start doing my ancestry searching. <laughs> So if somebody does want to, to find, the, find the library and start, because it is open to everybody. And if you are a geek like me and I've been eyeing up the B25 meal, which we won't go into that, um, where, where can somebody go to, to, to geek out and, and start buying themselves some copies of your incredible archive? Right. Yeah. So it's just aircorelibrary.com. That's our website. Um, and I will caveat that with in order to view the drawings, not Ken's drawings yet, because none of that's digital, but... Um, all of the other 460,000 engineering drawings that we have on the site. Um, you do need a membership, which obviously I'm a little bit biased, but I think is very cheap. $6 a month or $60 a year. And then you can access everything that we have. Um, yeah. Bargain. Yeah, it is kind of a bargain. <laughs> I, I threw in a really broad question, which we kind of talked about on email that as one of the things I've been finding putting this new podcast together is it's very easy to find men to talk to. And I was just wondering what you thought the health, very broadly, the health of women in aviation is. Because I know over my career, it changed drastically. But just looking at the sort of the, the war side of things, it's a chaps sort of place. How, how do you feel about our direction of travel? That is an accurate statement. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, I don't, I don't have 20 years of experience in the industry. I've got six-ish seven. I mean, for me, it's amazing. I, I prefer to work mostly with men. Um, I have always felt like it's easier. All of my jobs pretty much prior to this that I've enjoyed have been male dominated. Um, and I definitely think that that's something that you, as a woman in aviation, you have to be able to appreciate that. Um, but I mean, there's always, you know, people always say we need more women in aviation and there's maybe some reasons why there aren't as many, but I will say that the women who are involved in aviation and maybe specifically in warbirds are, they're absolutely amazing. Um, and I was just, after we'd emailed about it, I was thinking about it over the weekend and thinking about people like Connie Bolin or Heather Penny, or just because I saw them at Oshkosh, but these women who are so accomplished and are incredible role models for young girls who might have an interest in aviation. Um, and just, yeah, showing that, I mean, it's obviously possible to get into it and do everything that guys can do. I mean, everybody always says that and we know it's true, but there are some really incredible women out there who are still blazing the trail for people to to do something that is, is really cool. I mean, aviation is amazing. It's an incredible group of people to be involved with. Um, I'm, I always feel lucky 
when I go to events and things and you just look around and you're like, how did all these really great people just come together? But I mean, that's, that's what aviation is. And that's what makes it really neat. Esther, this has been fantastic. Thank you for giving up your lunch break to spend some time with me. Right. <laughs> of course it was great. <laughs> I cannot thank Esther Obi enough for joining me on the Damcasters. The work that Air Corps do in their restorations is simply stunning. And the aircraft they've got coming through the pipeline at the moment, especially that P-47 Razorback, are very, very special indeed. The great thing about the library, as Esther was telling us, is that it is available for everyone. I popped a link to the library, Esther's blog, all the information you need to know about Air Corps in the description below. Please do go check them out and follow the work that they're doing because it really, really is fantastic. Next time, we are joined by Elena Lewis of Culver Props and we discuss the fine art of crafting wooden propellers and Instagram because that's where I first found Culver Props. If you have enjoyed the podcast and would like to support us going forward, you can via Patreon. From just £3 a month plus VAT, you'll get all of our episodes on a dedicated feed ad free and before they head out to the rest of the world you'll also get a hand scrolled thank you postcard from me designed by aircraft.co.uk to say well thanks you can find our patreon page in the link in the description below or at patreon.com forward slash the damcasters all one word thank you for your support and until next time do take care of yourselves the damcasters is hosted and produced by matt bone and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.